Hi, this is Ted Holden in Victoria, Texas again. And I'm going to be talking about dinosaurs and gravity and the problems which the largest dinosaurs would have in our present world because of gravity. And this is the demonstration which I was giving at the Thunderbolts conference in Phoenix last weekend. And we ran into a problem with time at the conference. I'm going to, you know, we weren't able to completely finish the talk and I'm going to just proceed with the whole thing as if time wasn't a problem or I wasn't concerned about it here. So hopefully I'll get everything in and we'll see what happens. I'm going to we can figure out how to do it. I'm going to share my screen here. We're going to be watching a PowerPoint demonstration. Share the entire screen. Okay. Share. And the first thing that happens is you get this Einstein uh, mirror clock. But I'm going to get rid of that and put this other thing down. And you should be seeing the PowerPoint demonstration which I was using or trying to use for the Phoenix conference. And we're talking about both the history of gravity on our own planet and the nature of gravity. The two are related. Modern mathematics is based in part on the idea that there's such a thing as absolutely proving or disproving a proposition in real life. However, a proof or disproof is a kind of a transaction. There's no such thing as absolutely proving or disproving anything. There's only such a thing as proving or disproving something to somebody's satisfaction. Sooner or later, what you're really talking about is salesmanship. If the party of the second part is too thick or too ideologically committed to some other way of viewing reality, then you're not going to prove anything. The best proof in the world will fall flat and fail. What I have here is a, an attempt of mine to, to, to demonstrate that there actually are artificial things on Mars. This is sort of a proof, at least I would have thought. Um, you've got two things here, one of which is obviously a rock. The other thing, to me, is obviously a structure. You've got five edges, all of which are perfectly straight, two sides perfectly flat, and you've got what appear to be doors and windows. And this wasn't good enough. I mean, I still had people claiming that this was just a couple of rocks. You know, so the question is, what does that mean exactly? It means, it means that a proof has to be garish. It has to stand out. It has to be, you know, particularly when you're dealing with hostile audiences. You know, proofs have to be big, right? I, I mean, you can't have any kind of a, a questionable proof or any kind of a thing which is open to more than one interpretation. If you view Velikovsky and catastrophism, the EU, Saturn theory, and you know all the things which travel in that nexus as one kind of a thing, then the kinds of giant proofs that you would want, the kinds of giant proofs that P.T. Barnum would approve of, include, to my way of thinking, five or six things, I'm going to list them. You've got Velikovsky's prediction of the conditions which would be found on Venus and the conditions which are actually found there. And these predictions were made like in 1950 when what was being taught all over the world was that Venus was a sister planet of the Earth, that you know, Venus and Earth shared a similar history that Venus would be 15 degrees warmer than the Earth at, at any particular latitude. Okay, what Velikovsky claimed was that Venus would be candescently hot because of its recent formation, right? It simply hasn't had, it's a new planet, it hasn't had time to cool. What you actually find on Venus is like a surface temperature which would melt lead. You find a massive thermal imbalance, massive upwards infrared flux, complete lack of regolith, there's no dirt on Venus. Um, you know, these are all the kinds of things which you would expect from a new planet. Velikovsky was right about this. The second item, 
which is the subject of the talk for tonight, actually. The question of gravity in prehistoric times. Albert Einstein tried to describe gravity as a four-dimensional differential geometry kind of a thing. And you cannot start with that and believe that it ever could have changed or undergone any sort of a large change on our own planet in the recent past. But it's a very easy demonstration that it has. We'll get to that very shortly. The Val Marineris, the huge feature on Mars, which resembles our own Grand Canyon, which has all of the same kinds of features as the Grand Canyon. You know, this is simply too big. There, there's no way to believe that that could be caused by any kind of a river or any kind of a flow of water or any kind of a weapon. Some people claim to believe that the Val Marineris must, you know, that Mars must have undergone some sort of a nuclear war. But there's no weapon which could cause the, the Val Marineris. I mean, the claim of the people associated with the EU that Val Marineris is an electrical scar is about the only explanation that there is. The general condition of Mars, which you see in the MSL images, okay, basically they look, you've got remains of structures and rock plates lying on top of each other, catawampus all over much of the planet. Okay, this is beyond the scale of anything other than a, a cosmic catastrophe. You know, much of the planet, if not most of the planet, looks as if the whole planet had simply been picked up and shaken the way that a dog might shake a rat. You've got the rough 26 degree axis tilts of Neptune, Saturn, Earth, and Mars. Having four of the nine planets have roughly the same axis tilt, which is substantially different from the predicted mean value of zero as anomalous, and standard theories provide no explanation for it. This is something which is covered in Cosmos and Collision and the Ganymede hypothesis. What actually happened was that the system originally had been in the form of a single herbic hero string. Now, that is a Birkeland current with, you know, planets, uh, gas giant planets, dwarf stars, our own sun at the Z pinch points of, of this Birkeland current. What happened is that the southern part of this, uh, of this herbic hero string broke off at something like a 26 degree angle. Okay, so that the northern part, which included the bodies with the less than 10 degree axis tilt, the Sun, Mercury, and Jupiter, were a northern system. Okay, the southern part of the system, which included Neptune, so it certainly included Neptune, Saturn, Mars, and Earth, the bodies with the roughly 26 degree axis tilts, and which possibly may have included Uranus. It's a long story, but. These things flew into the plane of the sun system from the south at a 26 degree angle, more or less. And as the individual bodies spun out and began to orbit the way they do now, they simply kept the, the 26 degree angle of approach in the form of axis tilts just via ordinary gyroscopic force. There's one other kind of a thing which I would include in this list of big proofs of the EU and the short history of our solar system, which the people of Thunderbolts.info, which I believe in. And at any rate, this would be Bob Bass's observation that the backward spin of Venus cannot be primordial, that it has to have arisen via entanglement with some other planet, and that the curious phase lock between Venus and Earth indicates that the other body had to be Earth. In other words, if Velikovsky had never existed, would have to invent him. Now, the phase lock means that Venus shows us the same face at inferior conjunctions. Okay, and, uh, and standard theories have no explanation for that. We're going to be talking about dinosaurs here, and they keep on finding bigger dinosaurs. Now, what you're seeing here is an Argentinosaurus, which is a type of a Titanosaur, which is a very big dinosaur. You know, they used to, too, when I was in school, I used to teach that Bronosaur was, you know, a really big dinosaur. Bronosaur is nothing more than a middleweight these days. But you can see here, if you follow my mouse cursor, is a human, a man, who appears to be 
about six feet tall. It comes up to this creature's ankle. Okay, you can see this. I've lighted this image enough that you actually can see it. You've got two kinds, generally, of large dinosaurs. You've got the diplodocids, which hold their neck, which according to the bones of the structure, held their necks outwards. And then you've got the brachiosaurids, which held their necks upwards. Okay. The largest of the brachiosaurids appears to have been the ultrasaur, at least that we know of, that we have much in the way of bones for. You know, just by scaling, you know, an extrapolation from what we know about smaller dinosaurs, the, 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 the ultrasaur would have weighed about 180 tons. It's a very large animal. The diplodocids, the largest, is the seismosaur, which would be about 150 feet long. Now, we have more footprints than we have bones for large dinosaurs. Some of the footprints that we have indicate animals, which, which would most likely be 200 feet long or, or, or a little bit larger than that. So it's really huge animals in past ages, okay? Um, you've got a problem with the dinosaurs and the large dinosaurs, the sauropods and their necks and, and what you would want to do, you know, what a dinosaur would want to do with his neck. You could either hold it upwards or hold it outwards. Either way involves a problem. If a diplodocid, you know, the, the type of child his neck outwards, were to try to live in our gravity, then you could easily have a neck which would weigh 40,000 pounds, okay? And if the center of gravity of that neck was even 15 feet out from the shoulders, then you'd be looking at 600,000 foot-pounds of torque. Now, there isn't anything in a normal world which involves any more than a few thousand foot-pounds of torque. There's nothing that screws anything onto anything else. There's no nut or bolt or any kind of thing like that on any kind of a ship or anything which, which comes remotely close to 600,000 foot-pounds of torque. You know, if you ask yourself, what is there in the real world, in our normal world, which involves a half a million foot-pounds of torque, then what you'd really be talking about would be the combined maximum torque of all four of the engines of an Iowa-class battleship. Now, that is sufficient torque to drive a 55,000-ton ship through the water at 33 knots. And if one of these creatures was living today, he would have to try to hold that much torque with structures made of bone and muscle and sinew and tendons, and that simply is not possible. The brachiosaur is the other type of large dinosaur, which, you know, again, the bones indicate that, that he would have held his neck upwards rather than outwards. In that case, the torque problem may or may not go away, or at least most of it would go away. But he just picked up a problem which is just as bad. In other words, he's going to have an impossible problem getting blood to his brain. Okay, a giraffe's blood pressure would blow our vascular system or the vascular system to any other land animal apart. You know, the giraffe manages to contain this sort of, you know, because of the the height, which he's got to get blood to, just holding his neck upwards. His very thick arterial walls and very tight skin, which is like the pressure, pressure suit for a fighter pilot. Okay, the giraffe's head might reach 20 feet. The sauropod might have had to get blood to his brain at 50 or 60 feet. There were a couple of articles in the um, Natural History Journal, like in 1991. You know, we've dealt with these problems. You've got um, Harvey Lillywhite, University of Florida, Gainesville, said the heart of a barosaur must have uh, generated pressures at least six times greater than those of humans and three to four times greater than those of a giraffe. Okay, you had another in the same issue, you had a Peter Dobson noting that the kind of pressure that you're talking about would seemingly have placed the animal at severe risk of a stroke, an aneurysm, or some other circulatory system disaster. 
And the question that they're not asking is this, you know, or, 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 or you know, the, the, the thing that they're not talking about is, is the fact, you know, that you're talking about a creature which supposedly dominated the world for tens of millions of years, walking around in a permanent state of, of major risk of a circulatory system catastrophe is not a formula for dominating the earth for tens of millions of years. I, I mean, that's really the problem. So that um, Peter Dobson was thinking in terms of, you know, maybe all of these dinosaurs held their necks outwards, right? But again, you know, they were not looking, they, they didn't investigate the problem with the torque. I mean, that, that sort of, you know, when I mentioned that to them at the time, they were sort of taken aback, right? I mean, they hadn't even thought about it. When you look at an elephant and the way that his body is designed to deal with the kinds of weight that, that elephants have to deal with in our present world, what you're really seeing is Roman architecture. You're seeing legs, which are Roman columns, and you're seeing a spine, which is basically a Roman arch. The elephant's spine curves upwards, okay? And, you know, every other sort of land animal spine curves downwards to facilitate galloping. Elephants don't gallop. If an elephant's spine were to curve downwards the way rhinos or horses or any other kind of normal animals does, the elephant would collapse. And that's... Like I say, an animal that weighs four, five, six, seven, eight times, right? You know, no, nowhere as big. It's a large dinosaur. In the case of the dinosaurs, which would hold their necks outwards, you not only don't have, you, you don't have any supporting structure at all, but you know the arch goes the wrong way. You know this is completely horrible. There is no building inspector in North America who could be bribed sufficiently to let you hang a 40,000 pound weight off into space like that. You know, that, that's just crazy. <coughs> the largest birds which fly in our world are burkuts and albatrosses. You've got a busted bird which can fly just a little bit, right? Bustards, you don't see bustards in the sky overhead. It's like, you know, they fly sort of like wild chickens. I mean, just a hundred feet or so, and then back to running around. Now, the Burkut Eagle can get as large as 20, 23, 24, 25 pounds, right? At that point, any sort of a big meal, and they're gonna have a very difficult time getting back up into the air. You know, so that's about the limit for eagles. The albatross, also can get up to 22 or 25 pounds. And albatross, you know, they call them goony birds, right? And there's a reason for that. Their, their landings often look like controlled crashes. You know, sometimes they look like the bad carrier landing scenes in Victory at Sea. You know, they end up being killed or maimed trying to land occasionally. Their takeoffs, and, and albatross has to be faced straight into the wind in order to take off successfully, but it's just a dopey bird. He doesn't know that, right? So the, a lot of their takeoff attempts end up in failure. They, they huff and puff and huff and puff. They never really get airborne, and they sit there and try to recuperate for a half hour before they try it again. That's why they call them goony birds. So that you can see that the large, there, there's a size limit on flying, right? You, you've got you know, a, a limitation in our present world which did not exist in the past. I mean, the thing you're seeing in the picture here is an Argentinian territory, which is basically similar to a golden eagle, only you know, it could weigh anywhere from 150 to 250 pounds, 25 foot wingspan, right? And if you go to the next one of these pictures, then you've got one of the big bent pterosaurs, and a creature like that could weigh a thousand pounds. And you, you don't, you know, those wings had to be used, right? Well, let me tell you what exactly happened when they first started putting those bones together. Juan Langston at the University of Texas didn't really have enough in the way of wing bones to determine for sure, you know, what the wingspan of these creatures would have been. He, you know, from what he had, he thought he was looking at something like a 60 foot wingspan. But the engineering, the aeronautical engineering department at the University of Texas came down on him and said, you know, guy, it's like, you know, 
said, we'll let you put, you know, the goodness of our heart, we'll let, you know, it makes us look stupid enough to let you put one of these things together with a 40-foot wingspan, you know, the goodness of our hearts, we'll let you do that, right? We're not going to let you put these things together with, with a 60-foot wingspan. I mean, it makes us look like the fools of the earth, right? So they put them originally together with, uh, you know, as if they had a 40-foot wingspan. And then more recently, both in Mexico and Israel, they found bones of these creatures, which are a bit more complete, uh, and they do indicate a 60-foot wingspan. So, you know, you're just looking at colossally, uh, you know, much larger animals, which could fly in past ages than fly in our world today. There's a question about the size limits. Uh, I mean, every sort of creature in past ages was larger than, than, than anything is now, right, or than similar creatures are now. You could ask the question this way, if dinosaur sizes were such a winning ticket for creatures which supposedly dominated the Earth for tens of millions of years, then in the 65 million years which supposedly intervened between their age and ours, why has nothing else re-evolved into such sizes, or could it be that such sizes are no longer possible? The answer to all such questions concerning size ratios involves what we call square cube phenomena, that is, ratios of volume or weight which is proportional to volume to some measure of strength or efficiency that is proportional to surface area, body cross section, or some other squared figure. Do you ever wonder why it was always the littlest kid in your class in school who could do the most pull ups or push ups, or why you never see 200 pound athletes competing in gymnastics? It's the same general idea. Weight is proportional to volume, which is the cubed figure, width times breadth times height. While strength is proportional to cross section of bones and muscles, which is a squared figure like pi r squared, double your physical dimensions, and you have a factor of two that gets figured three times for volume and weight, with breadth height two four h will be eight times heavier. Whereas it only gets squared for cross section and strength, it'll only be four times stronger. In the case of the bird and his wings, then. Your ability to fly is the same kind of thing, right? It's surface area of wings, which is another squared figure. You know, there are a number of these squared figures which figure into these, the, the, these kinds of computations. Your ability to breathe is limited to surface area of lungs, right? W which is another squared figure. Um, there's several kinds of things that work the same way. You've got a problem if you keep doing that, obviously. You can only cut your power weight ratio in half so many times and still stand up. And you can compute a limit for that. What is the absolute limit for modern animals? When you start talking about comparing a human to a dinosaur or to an elephant, then the first thing you'll hear is that, you know, they must have had better muscle tissue than we have. That turns out not to be the case. We have, like from Cambridge University, no less, a, a statement indicating that muscle tissue for vertebrate animals is all pretty much the same. You know, there's positively no way to believe that dinosaurs had better muscle than humans do. What we're going to be looking at is comparing a top human weightlifter to a herb, a quadruped herbivore his own size, just to get an idea of what's possible and what isn't. Another objection might be that sauropods are aquatic creatures. You know, engineers in the late 1800s had started to believe that the, the large dinosaurs must have lived in water as a means of dealing with their weight. But nobody believes that anymore. They had no adaptation for life in the water. You know, they would have needed snowshoe feet. The feet they actually had would just go straight into muddy lake bottoms and river bottoms. They would take two or three steps and they'd be stuck there. I mean, that would be the end of it. You know, the teeth show wear and tear like you get from eating leaves and branches. You don't get that from eating water vegetation. And there are a couple of other problems with nobody believes that large dinosaurs live in water anymore. You might get a final objection that dinosaurs were somehow more efficient than top human athletes. They somehow had better leverage, but the superimposed images don't show any reason for, for believing that. No, they would have had to have had it would have had to be not need creatures in order for that to be the case, and that just isn't there. 
The basic reality is that a quadruped herbivore whose body is dominated by digestive apparatus is not going to be stronger on a per pound basis than a top human weightlifter. The mathematical size limit for the one will serve for the other as well. Now, if you put some one of your top power lifters like Bill Kasmeyer or as Benedict Magnuson next to a brachiosaur at equal sizes, you've got one creature at the top of the food chain, another at the bottom, pretty near the bottom, right? It's like Kazmaier or Magnuson's body is like 90% bone and muscle, right? The brachiosaur's body mostly gut and digestive system for processing leaves and grass. What is the limit for top human lifters like Bill Kazmaier or Benedict Magnuson? The sport of powerlifting involves the three most difficult total body lifts, the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift. The purpose of our study to use Magnuson's, actually it's like, let's assume we're talking about a thousand pounds, right? Then if you have, I did the calculation here without the 16 extra pounds, it doesn't really make much difference. Uh, what you're going to do is to say, okay, it's like you're going to, you're going to use a scaled lift. You're going to, to simply solve for the point at which the level of effort just to stand up is the same as for one of these maximum lifts. Okay. And, you know, we're talking about a fully warmed up go for the gold effort here. We're not talking about like an easy lift or anything. It's sort of like talking about a bunch of things at once here. We're going to be talking about two-thirds power body weight as a scaling factor. And this is the normal scaling factor that they use for weightlifting events where they're trying to get an idea of the, you know, which of the champions of the different weight divisions has actually done the best overall lift, right? And what they'll do is they'll divide the, you know, they'll take the two-thirds power of body weight of, of these champions in the different weight divisions and divide the lift number for the particular event by that two-thirds power. And the numbers all pretty much line up and become the same number roughly. It would be one that stands out a little bit, and that'll be the guy that just did the best lift. What exactly is two-thirds power of body weight? I mean. It's a general average of body cross-section, which is really what we want. Now, the way they go at that is to say, okay, it's like body weight is, you know, body weight we have, right? I mean, that's going to be proportional to, to volume, which, you know, you're going to assume that you've got some kind of a general notion of dimension, which you call small d, right? Body weight is going to be some number times d cubed. Right, to get back to D, you take the cube root of that, and then to get to a general average of body cross-section, you square that, right? So that, that's the two-thirds power of body weight. Again, the question is, like, what weight does just standing up require the same level of effort as that 1,000-pound, 1,016-pound deadlift for Bill Kazmaier or for Magnuson? What you do is you would... And like I said, I've neglected the 16 pounds here. Take the 1,000 pounds from the bar and add the weight of the athletes, 1,379 pounds, divided by the two-thirds power of, of, of the athlete's weight equals, on the right side of the equation, just the guy lifting himself, right, just standing up, x divided by two-thirds power of x, the cube root of x, so, so that x would be, like in this case, 18,000 18, pounds, 258. If I add the extra 16 pounds, it's more like about 18,800 and some odd. Okay, for Kazmaier at like 340 pounds doing a thousand pound squat or deadlift, you get a number like about 21, just shy of 21,000 pounds. It's somewhere between 18,000 and 21,000 pounds. It's going to be the mathematical size limit for the world. Okay, what that means is that at that weight, it would be everything in the world that one of the strongest possible athletes could do just to stand up. It would be the point at which just standing up would be the same effort as doing one of these thousand pound squats of deadlifts, which is a fully warmed up one shot go for the gold lift, right?
let me get back to this other thing for a moment just rehash um, what that says is that like the 21 or 22,000 pounds Bill, you know, the strongest human that we know anything about would cease to be functional. He would not be able to, to, to stand or walk because of the square cube problem. And that also says that a brachiosaur could not stand or walk beyond that. In our present world, you know, there's no way to believe that, that, that if Bill Kazmaier, his body is 90% you know, bone and muscle, couldn't stand or walk at 20,000 and 21,000 pounds, there's no way in the world that a, a break, you know, break you saw some creature's body is, is mostly gut and digestive system is going to stand up and walk beyond that same point. I mean, it's just not possible. Um, the real world limit for elephants, for creatures in our own world, is about 8,000 pounds. Okay, the that huge bush elephant, which is stuffed in the Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institute. Is said to have been about 8,000 pounds. Okay, um, Christopher McGowan at the Royal Toronto Museum noted that the largest elephant that they've ever had in, in the zoos in Canada was about 14,000 pounds. Okay, and we're talking about 1% of elephants or something like that. So the largest, you know, the largest animals that actually, you know, so you've got like a theoretical limit and then a real world limit is what you're talking about. The theoretical limit says, 18 to 21,000 pounds, the real world limit is somewhat, as you would expect, somewhat less than that, about 14, 15, 16,000 pounds. Okay, and that, that amounts to a certain type of sanity check, right? The fact that those two numbers are as close as they are. How much attenuation would you need for the ultrasound? How, how much would gravity have to change in order to have one of these largest dinosaurs walk around? Okay. What I've done is to simply equate the level of effort for the dinosaur, you know, the ultrasaur, 180 tons, right? And the um, it's like 360,000 pounds versus 16,000 pounds. Right, and the elephant. In other words, the level the level of effort to stand for the dinosaur in his world has, cannot be greater than than the level of effort to stand for the elephant in our world. Okay, so I'm saying the mass of the dinosaur times times the dinosaur's gravity divided by the two thirds power of the mass of the dinosaur is going to equal the mass of the elephant times the elephant's gravity divided by the two-thirds power of the mass of the elephant and just solve for the relationship between the dinosaur's gravity and ours to get a number which is about 2.8 to 1. You would need like at the very least uh, a 2.8 to 1 attenuation of gravity to have something like that be able to stand and walk. Remember I said that you had footprints of creatures which would be substantially larger than the ultrasaur. So, uh, and I'm fairly sure that, you know, real life, I mean, the attenuation of gravity was probably more than three to one. It was substantial. Expanding Earth theories, why do I not believe in, in Earth expanding theories? Okay, I, I mean, where do I start with this? You get people trying to claim that, you know, the Earth itself must have expanded. They're, they're, trying to solve two problems. One involves dinosaurs, the other involves the tectonic plates of the former supercontinent, Pangea, right? And then, you know, you've got a problem with the age of the Earth. Now, everything I've ever read about expanding Earth there is indicates that they're wanting to talk about, you know, 65 or 200 million years. Well, the honest truth is that they don't have that much time. Okay, we're, we're, we're living in a new world here. It's like all of these things that you read about, you know, the 65 million years which supposedly separate the age of dinosaurs from our age are falling away. For the last, since 2006, right, Mary Schweitzer at the University of North Carolina State, um, got four categories of evidence which have been coming in. You've got, got soft tissue increasingly being found in dinosaur remains. This includes collagen, 
blood vessels, hemoglobin, blood proteins, you got radiocarbon dates, you know, good radiocarbon dates coming in for dinosaur remains now, and these dates all come in between 20 and 40,000 years. The fact that anything radiocarbon dates at all says that it cannot be more than 60,000 years old, right? But beyond that, there won't be any radiocarbon. So, so that, you, you know, you've got a, a different sort of reality. You've got easily recognizable images of known dinosaur types turning up in American Indian petroglyphs. You've got American Indian oral traditions that speak of Indian ancestors having to deal with dinosaurs on a fairly regular basis. Cutting the main age of dinosaurs down to some 20 to 50,000 years does not leave time for any sort of an evolutionary scheme, and it doesn't leave time for expanding Earth theories. Now, I've got, I, I, I will have this document available, like on Facebook, on the Ganymede Hypothesis group in the file section. I've got links here to some of this information about dinosaurs. You've got um, recognizable dinosaur types w which turn up on canyon walls in North America. This would be a stegosaur glyph, which Indians called Mishi Pishu. Name is similar to the word Mississippi. Okay, it means water panther. Indian oral traditions describe Mishi Pishu as having red fur, a saw blade back, a great spiked tail, which he used as a weapon. Now, a stegosaur didn't have horns. I mean, they're describing a stegosaur. The horns were at, you know, Indians, touch-up artists used to touch these things up every 10 or 20 years. The horns were simply added at a much later date by some touch-up artists who figured a creature that large needed them. Okay. In Utah, at Natural Bridges, at the Katrina Bridge, you've got a, a recognizable image of a sauropod dinosaur. And you've got, like, the professional skeptics who try to claim that this is a snake, you know, that what appear to be legs are just figment of our imagination or something. But no snake ever coils himself up into a form like this. This is the form of a sauropod dinosaur. Okay, and that's grasping at straws. What about Pangea? You know, what is the other part of the reason for wanting to talk about Earth expanding theories? The answer is that the tectonic plates of the former supercontinent would not fit on our present, they wouldn't lie down flat on our present world. They want a small, seemingly would want a smaller world, a world of greater curvature. And there's another way to explain that. The way you explain that is that the tidal pull of this ancient Saturn, Saturnian system, you know, which is still a Herbert Harrow type of a system, would have pulled the, the Earth into an egg shape, right? I mean, Earth wasn't completely spherical in those days. It was egg shape, and the continental mass, Pangea, was lying on the high part of the egg. That explains the need for greater curvature. And you can look at the Earth itself. You can get on Google Earth, and you can see the remnants of this. You see, it's like the, the land mass of the Earth is not going to end up in one place for no particular reason. It's going to get pulled into one place by some titanic force of attraction, which, again, is the tidal pull, both electromagnetic and gravitational, of, of this Saturnian system. The center of the Earth in those days would have been the Portuguese Azores, the, the high point of which is Pico Island, which I think is five or 6,000 feet above sea level, the top of, and that's going to be right about here, which is the center of what they call the Mid-Atlantic Bulge. If you center Google Earth on Pico Island and then grab one corner here and drag, you know, and just spin the Earth around 180 degrees, then what you're going to be seeing is what I would call the Pacific Void, right? Mostly just water. Like I said, I mean, this says that you've got, you know, the, the one side, which is going to be, you know, all of the land mass of the Earth, which would have been, you know, pretty much connected together at that time. And then on the other side, just water. Okay. You've got a world. In fact, you've got a system like, like a cosmos sitting there, you know, 5,000, 10,000, you know, thousands of years on back, which was quite a lot different from the world that we live in, 
One of the differences involves static electricity. I mean, there's reason to think that you had a surface charge of the Earth, which was substantial, right? I mean, you talk about stone tools in the Stone Age. You know, why would why would Cro-Man and man have wanted to have you know all of his tools be made out of stone rather than metal? And the answer may be, and this is Troy McLaughlin's idea. The answer may be that the, with this much static electricity floating around, you didn't want to be carrying anything made out of metal around. You know, it's like every one of these professional golfers has been hit by lightning at least once, right? I mean, this would be, it would be tempting fate to walk around with a hammer or a spear with, you know, a whole lot of metal in it. No. The question is, you know, we're, we're concerned with what exactly is gravity and what is there that would cause you to believe that it would have been attenuated in past ages. Again, you can't start with what Albert Einstein said about gravity and believe it could have been attenuated in past ages. It means we're, we're basically, we want to throw out, we want to just take Einstein's whole, whole position on gravity and, and, and toss it, right? I mean, you know, that's not going to help us at all. What we're going to be talking about is Ralph Sansbury and the theory of gravity, which Walt Thornhill and I subscribe to. And there's a... Again, I'll have this document available like in the Ganymede Hypothesis group on, on Facebook in the file section, and this will just be a link, okay? What exactly was Ralph Sansbury talking about, you know, when he spoke about gravity? <coughs> okay, and, and why would Sansbury's theory of gravity be more amenable to being explained you know, in such a way that you can believe that it could have been attenuated in this age when you had all of the static electricity floating around. Okay. The neat thing about Ralph Sansbury, Ralph Sansbury was like, um, I believe, in charge of the, the Classical Phys Physics Society in New York, right? And basically was talking about subatomic particles and the nature of electrons in particular. And the word atom or atomic originally meant uncuttable, right? A means not or un, right? Atomic means cuttable, right? With appendectomy, any kind of word with T-O-M-Y at the end of it means cutting something out, right? Atomic meant uncuttable, right? So the atoms were at first considered to be point particles and you know, we stopped thinking about atoms as point particles, like late 1800s, right? It was like for the last hundred years or so, we have believed in, we believe that subatomic particles, electrons and protons were point particles, but in real life, there's no such thing as a point particle. Any kind of a particle or anything which occupies space has to have finite dimensions. Now, Ralph Sansbury claims that a, um, an electron itself is a, a, a ter terribly, terribly tiny orbital system of its own, right? With at least one central particle and, one, and at least one orbiting particle, the charges of which would sum to the charge for an electron. And the neat thing about Sansbury's theory is that it doesn't come from any sort of a back of the book type search for an answer involving gravity or anything like that. It arises from a very simple and mundane kind of a study of currents flowing through wires and electrostatic fields, right? Now he had discovered that a current moving through a wire created a transverse electrostatic field. And it's a small effect. I mean, it could easily be masked by other things, right? Nonetheless, it's there and it's detectable. And when you reverse the direction of the current on the wire, the electrostatic field reverses. And Ralph Sensbury's way of explaining that was terribly elegant, and I can't think of any other explanation for it. Here's what he said. He said that normally an electron, which is a small orbiting system, is in the form of a sphere, right? Which at rest does not represent any sort of a of an electrostatic dipole, right? Whereas he said when, the, when electrons are subjected to any kind of a force, which could be a voltage across a wire, then they get stretched into ellipsoids. And these ellipsoids do represent dipoles, 
right? So that all of the millions and trillions, whatever of, uh, of electrons in that wire are going to be stretched into dipole, electrostatic dipoles, which are all oriented the same way. Well, of course, that's going to create an electrostatic field. And of course, when you reverse the, the current on the wire, reverse the direction of the voltage, then, you know, that, that, that's going to change the orientation of the electrostatic field. Okay. So you've got a completely different sort of a view of reality here now. Sense where he also calcul calculated the necessary <coughs> velocity of a sub-electron particle, which he called a subtron. And he ended up with a velocity which would get you from here to Andromeda in one or two seconds, right? To something which is vastly, vastly greater than this thing we call C, which is the speed of light waves or electromagnetic radiation. Now, what exactly did he claim that gravity was? Well, Sandsbury claimed that gravity was also a question of electrostatic dipoles being created and aligned only this time, not by voltage, but by ordinary spin forces. Right? In other words, a spinning planet was going to end up with, uh, you know, just the centripetal uh, centrifugal forces were going to align all the, you're going to, to to, 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 I don't want to use the word change, right? But to force the electrons in the planet to align themselves radially. Uh, and that basically you were going to create electro electrostatic forces, which would integrate to what we call gravity in the mathematics when that does work out. Now, you know, this also means that gravity is a first cousin to every kind of a thing you know, which also, you know, to gyroscopic forces, to the phenomenon, phenomena that you get in baseball, you know, like sinkers and sliders and things where you get radical behavior on a baseball, which people have thought involved just the seams on a baseball biting into the air, but that, that's pretty lame, right? Um, at any rate, okay, so much for this little thing. The, the next thing I should talk about, like I said, I mean, gravity and, and gyroscopic force turn out to be first cousins, both based on the same sort of thing. It's like you normally would think about rotating something like a basketball spinning. You know, you get people who can actually spin a basketball on the tip of one of their fingers. And you're not going to see much of anything that looks like gravity because you've either got to make the thing very much larger like a planet or you've got to spin it very much faster like a gyroscope before you start to notice much of an effect. But some of the effects that you get are sort of astounding. Let's take a look at this. Let's just go to... Um, nah, let's see if I have this saved off. Give me a second. To the type here. Looks like I am this. here at the University of Sydney where the mechanical engineering shop has built this incredible piece of apparatus for me. It is a 40 pound, that is 19 kilogram flywheel on the end of a meter long shaft. Can you imagine trying to hold this out horizontally with just one hand at this end? It is virtually it is impossible, okay? Now I'm gonna let go. Are you gonna be able to hold this at all? I'm sorry. So you got both the nerd and the jock, right? Neither one of them can do this. Come on, just try to, I want you to hold it out for us. See if you can. Hold it, hold it. Oh, come on. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to spin this up to a few thousand RPM, and then I'm going to attempt just that. Hold it from one end to have it out horizontally. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, boom. And I'll let go of my left hand. What you'll see is that the shaft remains horizontal. You see it going around there. It almost looks as though the wheel is weightless. How does this work? Well, instead of pulling the wheel down to the ground as you'd expect, the weight of the wheel creates a torque which pushes it around in a circle. 
you may recognize this as gyroscopic precession. For a more detailed explanation, click the annotation or the link in the description to see my video on the topic. Here, I want to try something more extreme. I'm going to try to lift it over my head with one hand while it's spinning. Wish me luck. But before I make the attempt, Rod wisely right. suggests yeah, that yeah, I first yeah. check if I can lift the wheel above my head without okay. it spinning. Let's prove that I can lift it just this end without it spinning. Here we go. Yeah. Ah. I mean, it's just kind of awkward with the hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Just barely. Oh, goodness. Do you even lift? Uh, clearly, I do not. Undaunted by my lack of strength, I'm going for it. But I want to make sure that the wheel is spinning as fast as possible to give me the best chance of success. That was perfect. And I'm going to release my left hand and holding only with my right hand at the end of the shaft. I'll try to lift it up over my head. This is a 40 pound. 19 kilograms. Okay, there's no way in the world he can be doing this, but this thing still weighs 40 two, pounds. One. Beautiful. That's no problem. In three, two, one. This little experiment drives physics professors crazy because they worship Albert Einstein, and this obviously makes a hash out of everything that Einstein ever tried to say about gravity. The one thing which somebody should try to do would be to run this particular experiment while standing on some kind of a scale, okay, to see what exactly happened. I don't think anybody's done that. It seems obvious enough. I mean, it's the first thing I would want to try to do. But, I mean, you understand what I'm saying, right? You can talk about gyroscopic precession all you want, but, I mean, whether that thing's turning or not, I mean, if that thing still weighed 40 pounds, there's no way in the world the guy could be holding that thing by the end of that bar and hold it, hold it over his head as if it wasn't difficult. I mean, the guy couldn't even hold it up close to the wheel and get it over his head other than just, you know, with a maximum effort. So, I mean, it seems to me obvious enough that you've got a case of gravity being attenuated just by, you know, phenomenon, which, which is a kind of a first cousin to gravity. Now, in past ages, in past ages, then you've got the question of gravity basically being an electrostatic dipole effect, and it's fairly easy to believe that a major surface charge of the Earth, which you would have had from this Birkeland current, which you still had like e even five, six, seven thousand years ago, will, would have damped that, right? I mean, that, that, that's not difficult to believe. At any rate, that that's the that's the little lecture which was prepared for Phoenix here. Let me try to get back to, try to get back to, to like just regular Google Hangouts here. Okay, again, this is Ted Holden in Victoria, Texas signing off. I'm sorry if that was a bit long, right? But that's what I intended to present at Phoenix. And we're going to put that up on the um, Ganymede Hypothesis group on Facebook and also like just leave this here for people to see like on, on the YouTube uh, channel for Ganymede Hypothesis. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.